Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. Now, I'm going to get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. Now, before we get started, get out your calendars. We want to tell you again about some exciting news. James and I are taking Politics War Room on tour. So come see us live at the 92nd Street Y in New York City on September 19th. That's a week from Thursday, September 19th at the 92nd Street Y. And then in Atlanta on October 12th at the Variety Playhouse. And finally at Boston's Schubert Theater on November 2nd, three days before the election. Get tickets at politicon.com slash tour. We can't wait to see you there. We're going to have some really interesting guests. Get text updates about what's next for Politicon and Politics War Room by signing up at politicon.com and tell your friends about us. Please remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please check out the links to our sponsors, Beam, Miracle Made, and ExpressVPN. We thank you for supporting these sponsors because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. Hey, James, Tuesday night's debate, Harris v. Trump, may be a seminal moment in this campaign. And that being the case, we looked far and wide. No holes barred to get the best political expert analyst that we could as a guest to talk about this. And we struck gold. We found him, James Carville. So therefore, it's going to be you. I'm going to briefly make a few points and turn it over, turn over the analysis to the incomparable, Mr. Carville. Uh, I thought Harris very effectively did what she had to do on Tuesday night, focused enough on the future and brushed aside his tirades. She was especially effective on abortion, an issue that makes him just visibly squirm. Trunk became increasingly unhinged. You know, we talked last week. I was a little worried he might bait her. Instead, she baited him, and he went bonkers. So talking about migrants eating cats and dogs and calling her a Marxist. Uh, I don't know if it's going to move the needle, the needle much, but it was a good night for Kamala Harris. Don't you agree? I, I, I agree, and, uh, uh, but equally important, it was a bad night for him. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, you can conflate the two. I don't know what of, of the two is more important. But, uh, you know, I, one thing I, I felt pretty good about, and uh, you felt the same way, so I can disclose this to our viewers or listeners. We both thought she'd do well, and we're pretty upfront about it. Uh, Fox ran a big story about me saying that, I thought Trump was walking into a trap, and he 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 walked right into a trap. He really did. Well, you had said you thought he might cancel, uh, and uh, and perhaps he should have. Should have. Yeah, it would have been a good idea. But, but you know, Al, there were a couple of things. I, I don't want to. Or clearly, but by the public stuff we see, the Dow groups, the Instapol, which affects coverage a lot. It's 63.37. For her, a direct reversal of what it was on uh, June 27th. Right. In 37 of just diehard party Hmm. regulars. But the question is, will it drive voting behavior? So when, when you know we do polls, and we'd say if such and such said this. Do you agree or disagree with that? That's not the right question. The question is, having heard this, does this make you more or less likely to vote for someone? So we know that people voted that she won the debate. It, it, it's very preliminary. It's not overly scientific, but I suspect that will hold up. I have heard. Uh, that they have, there were a couple of questions that were asked by some people that, that uh, voting behavior and that it did change in her direction some. This is way preliminary, but what I would say is what we want to look at was today is uh, Wednesday, probably coming over the weekend polls or early next week, see if this has had, if, if this has driven anything in the vote. 
I, I, I'm pretty confident that she won the debate or he lost it. And it, it matters something. It matters a little bit as to did she win more than he lose more? And uh, uh, I, I, I thought it was the eventful night. I mean, I felt very good about it, obviously. Uh, and and I, I was asking a lot of Democrats, you included, you know, what, what did you see wrong with it? Because Democrats are always going to find something that, that they can criticize. But boy, there was very little that you could criticize in this thing that I, from the standpoint of being a Democrat, I think. Yeah, one leading indicator, James, was that immediately afterwards, Brian Fallon, her communications person, said, let's have another debate. Uh, I'm not sure that they really want to have another debate, but uh, Trump wants to have three on Fox. I think that's a non-starter. Um, but, uh, oh, no, he won, get out. he won the debate. <laughs> okay, you, know, you don't understand that. James, right? thank have... God you're here to tell me that because I didn't have any idea. Well, he he was very bullish on his performance. I, I believe that he talked about 91% or something. <laughs> and... And she's already said she'll do another debate. And he said he doesn't think he uh, – right, right, of course, it doesn't matter what he says. Yeah. But it, my, my favorite little thing about it is CNN, uh, the guy Daniel Dale, who the, he was from Toronto and the heart of him as a fact checker, it, he lied 33 times and Harris lied once. Okay, 33 to 1 baseball game. We didn't do too good. <laughs> Yeah, Nick, Saban, Nick, Nick Saban would love that record. Uh, yeah. James, you know, it is a point that uh, we picked up on in recent weeks. But Nikki Haley's The World said he needs to talk about policy. Uh, you know, <laughs> not just the familiar. <laughs> well, we saw last night why he can't talk much about policy other than railing about undocumented workers he's going to deport. 10 million of them be a social and economic disaster and his false claims about tariffs he, he uh, about tariffs he didn't have anything to say doesn't have a health care policy as after nine years has no idea what it is when they moved to his tax policy he immediately shifted to immigration um, he says on 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 obamacare he said it sucks but i don't know what i would do if i got rid of it um, uh, and on foreign policy his hero his hero is victor orban the most autocratic government leader in Europe. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, Governor Haley and uh, Lindsey Graham or Squiggly T. Biscuit, as Chris Buckley calls him. He can't talk about policy because he doesn't have any. So Paul McGowan texts me, he says, if immigrants are eating lap dogs, shouldn't, shouldn't Lindsey Graham be really worried? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that was a high point. There's, you know, there's no, there's no question. So, you know, to some extent, his performance reminded me of his 2017 inaugural. Remember uh, when he talked about American carnage and afterwards President yeah, George okay. W. Bush, Bush said that was some crazy shit. Weird. No, I said that was some weird shit. Weird shit, right. Uh, but so they were talking, you know, I, I love the issues caucus. See, he just talked about the issues. Right. Look, we, we don't like the tweets, but we like the issues, okay? And so the, the big issue was the southern border. She more than uh, acquitted herself last night. I thought she was pretty good on that. And so they go to him, and, he's, and she's made him, and he's talking about crowd size. So he's got the number one issue that he should have, that the, the, the issue chorus is saying, Talk, just talk about the issues. Okay. You had a chance to talk about the issues and you talked about crowd size. Uh, it, it was the, the more that I think about it, you know, I went to bed last night. Uh, you know, I texted back and forth and I was feeling pretty good. And then when I thought about it and I looked at the clips and looked at some of the coverage and particularly looked at some of the conservative coverage, I mean, they were kind of mean to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How dare you disappoint us? Wall Street Journal right. editorial page, uh, you, yeah, Ross Douthat and others. Did you expect something else? Yeah. All right. Really? Hey, what did you think was going to happen? James, I and, make a – go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I thought she was particularly well prepared. I, I always thought that she would be. 
I, I think when we come out there, there's a couple MVPs. They all did a good job. Don't get me wrong. But two people of you may heard it less of. I, I know Philippe Reigns was great. That's what I and heard. I was he was Trump. Reliant. He played Trump. He played Trump, and, and he dressed in, like, Trump clothes. I don't, he might have put a wig on. All right? It, but, but he really, really took his role very seriously. And I'm pretty sure that Michael Sheehan was in there, and you could see Michael at work. And, I mean, uh, the, the, one of the killer lines was, I mean, she said, I'm not Joe Biden. Right. And, and, and they, you know, they rehearsed that seven times. But I'm not, I'm not you either. You know, thinking it's of Michael bad. Sheehan, I, I, I agree with you totally on him. I, 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 well, I have to verify Michael, kill, kill us for saying, for missing his name. But if, and I suspect he was in that prep, and I suspected he made a, a huge difference. But, uh, it, you know, they've spent four days. That's great. Who cares? Spent a week yeah. doing prep. Practice every line. James, uh, the other point about if I think Michael Sheehan was there and if he was, his signature was all over, her cutaways. where mm -hmm. What she was doing while he was going and she was looking serious. She she didn't um, she didn't grimace or anything. At one point, she put her hand on her chin in amusement and looked at him. And I was with George Stevens, the great movie producer, who said his father, the great director, said that cutaways, if you cut away to Jimmy Stewart, you know you have a great scene because he's just that good. Her cutaways last night while he was speaking were really good. Michael teaches that minute after minute. You're never off count. Right, right. Okay, never scowl, never, you know, furry your brow or whatever. You know, what do you do when you're under attack? You take a pencil, you act like you're writing, you look down, you look up, you might smile, you might not. I mean, there's a whole protocol. I, I, I'd love to do a, I don't know, 15-minute special on behind the scenes at debate prep. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, what, 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 how, how do you do it? And maybe at a point we can get somebody who was instrumental in this debate prep. Uh, on the show to just talk about it probably better than well it Michael right doesn't like to go public very often but he is terrific and I talk to him as you do periodically so let me uh, let me check with him let me make a yeah. uh, one final point you may have more observations that's on the moderators my initial instinct was to be critical for one reason I'm, I'm less so now the right wing is all over them I mean the apologists from bootlickers like Lindsey Graham to the fallen from grace supposed that journalist Megyn Kelly are saying it was three on one it was that's total complete bullshit they did fact check Trump a few times two or three as you say the uh, guy uh, Daniel Dale found 33 lies so you know they fact checked uh, five or ten percent uh, there were things like when he said that spring in, in Springfield, Ohio, the migrants were eating cats and dogs. And the people in Springfield, Ohio, the leader said, this is not true. There's no incident of that at all. And when he said the, on the other occasion, the Democrats favor uh, abortion up to nine months and even after birth, just simply not true. It's illegal. So I think those were, were absolutely appropriate fact checks. On the other side, I thought that he did let Trump David Muir let Trump run over him a few times. He went on when he wasn't supposed to. He spoke for five more minutes than Harris did. In fact, maybe that was a break for Harris. The more Trump spoke, the worse it got. And so I, I you know, I, I would give them a, at least a B minus. And the fact checking they did, the selective fact checking, was what CNN should have done last ju June and didn't. So I, I guess this is something. We could discuss it at a little more length at a different time. How involved should moderators be? Should they just be umpires? Well, you know, if he's going to do the fact check, and he said, well, we should note that Donald Trump went five minutes over the agreed to limit. I mean, could, should you do that kind of stuff? You should just let people draw their own conclusions. I, I didn't... Uh, you know, a moderator should, I guess, should kind of be unremarkable. If you go to the baseball game and you didn't notice the umpires, then that's the highest compliment you can pay to the umpires. 
Yeah, James, I think I use the term selectively, and that's what I think. I mean, I don't think that, uh, you know, when Trump said I created the greatest economy in the history of the world, you don't fact check that. I mean, that's an opinion. Uh, but when he does say that uh, basically Democrats are for killing babies after they're born, I mean, that's just so blatantly untrue that I think well, it's, it's justifiable. But what very well, what selective. you could do at that point is say, Vice President Harris, you're a lifelong Democrat. Is that true, what he just said? Well, that may be, yeah. I, I don't know. I, but but I think it's, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that you're wrong or you're right, all right? But, you know, maybe that somebody should do a, a handbook for debate moderators. You know, you're not going to get people to agree on everything. Yeah, yeah. You understand? But, but I think for the most part, it was a, fa a fair game was played last night. You know, you might argue with one call here, yep. and it was a, you know, a, a, it was an interference call. Or it was something like that. But for the most part, uh, I, to the extent that you could, I think you got a pretty good idea of who both were and how well they were prepared and but what they did. And that that's success. It was the best, actually, in many ways, it was the best presidential debate in a long time. Now, the competition hasn't been that tough, but uh, it really was, and uh, you did. The important point is you got a much, you got a better feel for Kamala Harris, and if you were, if you thought there was a new Trump last night, would have dissuaded you. Uh, oh, it's never going to be. Now, the question is going to be, and we'll, we'll have the answer shortly, for, by, by Friday, by, by, by the latest who whose fault was this? Who's he going to blame? And, and I can tell you right now, Chris Lasavita, Corey Lewandowski, Susie Wiles, Bannon, if, if he's out of jail. He's in jail. I mean, huh? He's in jail still. I think he's getting close to getting out. I, but whatever. Yeah. Roger, I mean, there is a big S fur flying in bar lago or Bedminster or wherever they are, because we know one person that's not at fault. And that's Trump. Mm -hmm. and, and some faction is going to get, you know, the, the leaks are coming. Uh, you know, Fox and Newsmax, the whole thing is going to be coming. And I, I love the delicious aftermath of the finger pointing. Oh. And you know you're going to have it. You, you want a behind-the-scenes video of debate prep. I want a behind-the-scenes video of Mar-a-Lago or Bedminster the no, next couple of days. I, 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 both of them are going to be fascinating. But I, I think that we're in fascinating times. And again, is he going to decide that he wants to do another debate? What do you think? And, and what should she do? Well, she said she'd do one. Yeah, but but okay. which one and where and, you know, who? I, that, but... If I'm her, why wouldn't I? Would you do a I mean, would you do a Fox has, debate? But what she has now is a gift. She has confidence, and uh, I, I, if I were her, if I were her people, I'd say, uh, you know, go meet him fifty two percent of the way. I mean, you don't you don't need it like you need it. For, the, the, the subtle thing about this thing, Alice race, is. Given the sort of polls that came out three or four days ago, right. it kind of shifted a little bit to like he was in charge. All right. Today, she's more in charge. And that's, that's, you know, I can't, I can't argue how, how big the, the, bump if there's going to be a bump or the changes, but there has been a subtle shift in dynamic in this race. I'm pretty confident about that. Uh, would if, if the choice is a Fox debate, would you do it if you were her? I would. Mm -hmm. it, but it, because Fox would be limited. I mean, first of all, she would have, and, and Brent Baer is not the same thing as Laura Ingram. Right. I mean, there's this, this whole thing where Fox becomes a, a, a whole word that means everything to everybody. It, e even in Fox, there are distinctions. And if she agreed to Fox, she would have a lot more input on the moderator, the format, 
anything else, and if she agreed to CNN or, or MSN, you know, MSNBC or right. something like right. that. Right. I, I mean, you, you got to assess what advantages would I have, and I think she has confidence now. I, I think she feels like I got this guy's number. I can do this, and. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would, I mean, I would certainly say I would do it. I, I, it because it's the easiest thing in the world is to get out of a debate and say, well, it was just unreasonable and it demands that we couldn't go along with it. But I got a feeling that Fox would give her both anything she asked for to get this debate. This is a ratings bonanza. This is a money, ABC, uh, they were scared to death this debate wouldn't go on. Uh, it, it was a real coup for that. And she's got a, the dynamic in this race has shifted. I, I don't know how the polls are shifted, but I think the dynamic is clearly shifted. Well, we, we, that. we look forward to it. And, you know, the one thing we did say she was going to do well. And you know what, James? Yes. This is one of those times we were right. She did do that, well. That's how I, yeah, I don't want to go, I don't want to say that we're always right. But it, in this one, I, I can feel it coming. I, I think the, the question you asked about the next one is important. And it, it, but I do think there has been a, a appreciable shift in the power dynamic here. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, it's not a reach to say the fate of the country could come down to the battleground state of Georgia. So James and I are going there to do our part. We're marching to Georgia. We're taking Politics War Room to Atlanta for a live show on October 12th at the Variety Playhouse. It's going to be a great time. Well, I, 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 I can promise them that they're going to have a good time. And I can promise them that we're going to have a very lively conversation about what's going on, the, the centrality of Georgia to everything. By the way, I, I, I mean, as a point, I was there a place in my heart. It's the state of my birth. It was the state of one of my most satisfying political victories, I guess, too, if you count the re-election of, of, of Governor Zell Miller. Uh, it's a state where uh, the first president of LSU had a sort of impact on the state of Georgia, if you will. Uh, you talked about marching through Georgia. He was the guy that marched through Georgia. And you can go, at least you could in the 90s, I expect you still can go to underground Atlanta and still see scars of where Atlanta would burn. I, I don't think Sherman intentionally meant to burn Atlanta. He meant to burn certain ammunition stocks and stuff, but I don't think they gave them. They were not overly concerned that the fire got out of control. <laughs> we both have a lot of family connections to Georgia and a lot of friends yeah. there. Yeah, uh, I look forward to it. It's a great. Yeah. And by the way, you could. It's easy to get to. There's a lot of flights to Atlanta. <laughs> right. It's going to be an incredible show, and you'll never forget that you helped us bring the vibes to Atlanta that put Kamala Harris in the Oval Office. All you have to do is go to politicon.com/tour. That's politicon.com/tour and get your tickets for October 12th at the Variety Playhouse in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, don't wait. They're going fast, and we want to see as many of you there as we can. So head to politicon.com slash tour now to get your tickets. The road to the White House is starting. We'll see you there. Okay, James, finally, uh, uh, what should Harris do uh, looking ahead? Well, I'm a big believer that in a way that, like, a Civil War general would look at the terrain. And it was very important that you have certain high ground where the terrain goes. I think our campaign strategists need to look at the calendar. Now, I want to say something that has not been mentioned. You've seen very little about it. What is the date today that we're doing this? We're doing it on the 11th of September. Remember that day? Yep. Okay. It, 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 it is receded. It, it, I'm not saying it's a good thing or bad thing, but it's amazing that we were so defined by the 11th of September, and now we barely remember it. it, it it's just, it's not a, a, a knock on us, it's just a knock on the way that human history, the human mind works. I think going forward, there's two 
dates that the Harris campaign needs to be aware of. And it, 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 I think offers them opportunity to be heard. One is 18 September, right? So, well, what is 18 September? Okay, that's the date that the Fed meets. So, to people that we know, like us, this is already priced in, in, in the market. Okay, you, you would not go on CNBC or, or one of these business shows and, and mention that because everybody quote, knows, unquote, they're going to cut rates. Actually, there is some suspense as to whether they cut rates a, a quarter of a point or, I don't know, 25 basis points. I have it. they talk and they go a half. And they'll issue a statement about future guidance. But when people see this, th 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 there's actually some decent economic news out there if people see this, it, 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 that this is the first time that they're going to hear that interest rates may be coming down. And uh, the point I want to make is, is the question is not, is, do, do you, is this a good economy or bad economy? Choose one. I, I think it's pretty clear that even right now we would have more people saying it's a, a bad economy and not very good economy. There's going to be a point, and I hope that we reached it, where people feel like they have something to lose. All right? And, and, and I thought she did a good job talking about Trump's tariffs last night, the 18 Nobel laureates. In one sense, who gives a shit with 18 Nobel laureates? In another sense, people do because they feel like, hey, in a Wall Street Journal this morning, headline in a journal, first time since pandemic incomes are up four percent and they're just for inflation all right so if, if 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 this thing shifts to the point where you're not going to get people to say the economy is good but you're going to get people say that, that say we have something at risk here that's a pretty big event and you're going to have people say that before they're going to admit that it's good the second big day is the 7th of october which is going to be the one-year anniversary of the Hamas intrusions, or, or, or whatever you want to call it. And that gives her, it's going to be a lot of attention paid to that. You know, she can give a, a, a big kind of speech on her kind of views in the Middle East, and it can be quasi-generic, but she's going, to get, oh, she's going to get credit, she's going to get coverage. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, we know, there's a thousand foreign policy types that can, you know, give her advice and how she say that. I remember we did the foreign policy stuff at, uh, at Georgetown. Maybe she needs to schedule the event. Who cares? It's not the most crazy thing. Go to the Detroit Economic Club and open it for questions. They're not going to, your good chance to be elected president of the United States, uh, they're going to be respectful. But you've got two events that you can play off of. And that, that's why I say that good campaigns look at the calendar the way that good generals look at the terrain. And she has an opportunity in both, but I do think it's significant. And it doesn't mean much, mean much say much about us, but the, the, the basically September 11th is receded. And I'm sure the terrorists will come back and people say we should have remembered. I uh, understand that, but it's just the calendar is really an important thing in political campaign. Okay, September 18th and October 7th. Remember that out there. Drift off to dreamland would be, look, this stuff, we talk about it a lot. This stuff is A, it tastes good. It's soothing, and it, it helps you get a better night's sleep. It's just for fact. And we talk about this a lot, and we believe this, and I'm sure we're right, is for an otherwise relatively healthy person, a good night's sleep is the biggest determinative of how you feel the next day. I, I know that's true of me. I know you've said it before. It's true of you. I know from anecdotal, massive anecdotal evidence, it's true for a lot of people. And 
Boy, the difference between seven hours and 15 minutes sleep and four hours and 15 minutes sleep is quadruple. You know, sleep is the foundation of your mental and physical health. Now, when you sleep well, you perform at your best, mentally and physically. Proper sleep can also increase focus, it boosts energy, and it improves your mood. Introducing Beam's Dream Powder, a science-backed, healthy hot cocoa for sleep. Dream has been a game changer for sleep for so many people. Politics can be stressful, and it was horrible watching the hours tick by until the alarm went off and you were so tired. Now you can know that all it takes is one delicious cup of beam before bed and you'll be sleeping great ready for the next day. Today our listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder. Their science-backed, healthy, hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Better sleep has never tasted better. There are tons of delicious flavors like chocolate, peanut butter, cinnamon cocoa, and sea salt caramel but they're all only 15 calories with zero grams of sugar. Now, I can't get enough of the chocolate peanut butter. It's always a treat. And now, when to sleep better, you know, it no longer keeps us up at night. Other sleep aids can cause next-day grogginess, but Dream contains a powerful, all-natural blend of reishi extract, magnesium, theanine, melatonin, and nano-CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Dream works fast, and the numbers don't lie. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get better sleep. Now, how great are those odds, James? 93 is a, that, that's a high number. And, you know, to be tested and in, in, in verified like that, 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 that you can have a lot of confidence. Ninety-three percent is a huge number. Yeah, it sure is. Because Beam Dream is easy to add to your nighttime routine. You just mix Dream into hot water or milk, froth and enjoy before bed. You'll find out why Forbes and the New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. So, if you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder and get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash warroom and use the code warroom at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash warroom and use code warroom for up to 40% off. Also, you can find the link in our show notes. Now for the outrage of the week, House Republicans have thrown in the towel on their witch hunts against President Biden and his troubled son, Hunter. But in the closing weeks, these pitiful imitators of Sherlock Holmes are trying to dig up dirt on Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. They want to haul Walls in about a federal food program in Minnesota. Oh, boy, they go after big stuff. The always predictable and usually wrong Elise Stefanik, is demanding an inquiry into a Harris staffer's connection to any Iranian intelligence. You know, that's really rich. Stefanik had declared that President Biden was involved in, I quote, the biggest political corruption scandal in my lifetime, but I would say even the last 100 years, end quote. I guess poor Elise never took a history course at Harvard. Of course, as they tried to impeach Biden, they came up with no evidence whatsoever, none. But there were two supposedly critical sources that Stefanik, Comer, and Jim Jordan. James, you remember Jim Jordan, the one accused by at least six Ohio State wrestlers of covering up sexual abuse uh, when he worked there. Anyway, they had two bombshell witnesses. Both were indicted. One was tied to Russian intelligence. The other to Chinese intelligence. You can't make this stuff up. These House Republicans are the most incompetent clowns I have ever seen in more than 50 years of covering and observing congressional investigations. You know, I, I guess my outrage is kind of dovetails with yours. It, it, people say, well, we need a healthy two-party system. And 
you know, it's, we should have a, a kind of center left party and a center right party, and, 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 and I, probably some truth to that. But but I think what we have more than an ideological disaster of the Republican Party, which you know, Dick Cheney is said, "I'm voting for a Democrat." I mean, stop it with that. But what you really have is a massively incompetent political party. You saw that demonstrated time and time and time again in these congressional here. I mean, James Comer or Jim, G-Y-M Jordan or Matt Gates, or these people, they're not just political ideological clowns, they're, they're competence clowns. It, it, you see this time and time again. What you saw on the part of Trump last night was not that he was just crazy and not grounded and whatever. There was no competence. There was no preparation. All right, I, I will give my wife a shout out. When she was Cheney's communications person, a definite uh, counsel to the vice president. You know, when he did a debate, he was confident. I mean, we debated at, at John Edwards in 2004. You, you, every, we all kind of thought Edwards was going to win. He was an experienced trial lawyer. I mean, the people say that, well, Harris doesn't do long-form interviews. Cheney was famous for sitting there for 40 minutes with Tim Russell. And they disagreed, but he was confident. You didn't look at Dick Cheney. You said, maybe I don't like him. I don't like his wars. I think he's orthodox. Uh, I, I don't think he has a great sense of humor. I think, but you never looked at Cheney and said he was ill prepared. And, and if you were a Republican, or particularly a conservative Republican, you didn't look at him and say, oh my God, this guy's a clown. I can't believe that they would sit down Sunday morning and be totally unprepared and stupid. And I, of course, I think there's, there's not ideology of Trump, it's just criminality. And they have a problem. They really, really have a competence problem. They're incompetent people, and they're very tolerant of incompetence. And, and that's just a fact of American life that the, the Republican, if you look at these congressional people, I, I, you will not tell me. That, that, okay, we're both not very se secret about, we, about how a general worldview tends to, to trend center left. But if there were people in a Democratic Party that were this massively incompetent, that were buffoons of this level, we would get mad about it. And they don't seem to care. This, this, this seems to be the Jim Jordans and Jim Kramers and, and Elise Stefanik's. They, they just blend in with the wallpaper. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm being a, a great, you know, chin-scratching American, but I don't, I don't expect them to have two parties I agree with. But is it too much to expect just rudimentary confidence from one party? I don't think it is. Well, they sure don't have it in the House. And they don't. And they don't seem to give a shit. Right. No. They don't seem to give a shit. They seem to be fine with that. And also look at the look at the lemmings who went along with them. I mean, it wasn't just those three and four and five, but the lemmings who went along with all these. In, I mean, the fake impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, it just, you know, there ought to be some accountability for that. Yeah, the other thing is, I, I, I can say something nice about Dick Cheney. He said, I'm voting for Harris, period, end of memo. I don't want to call anybody out by name, but, but let me give you two initials that I want to call out. Rex Tillerson and Jim Mattis. If I hear one more story about how they think Trump is a buffoon or, or is an idiot, why don't you say something? What are you scared? Somebody's not going to play Jim Rummy with you at the Dallas Country Club or, or, or some retired four-star is, is not going to sit out and have dinner with you and your wife at the officer's club? I mean, come on, people, the country's at risk. You, it, it, you know something, say something. Do what Cheney did. You don't have to do what Liz did and endorse Colin Howard, but just issue a statement. I'm voting for Harris. You don't have to say any more. Why are you just sitting there 
watching this goddamn idiot have a chance to be elected. Well, I do think they have to say that, but they have to say more. They have to say that Trump, they know, is an existential danger to Americans uh, national interest. I think, you know, that's part of the endorsement because that's what they know. That's the reason they're endorsing. You know, and if they I, just said, and that's saying, important. If they just said, I'm voting for Harris, and then they could leak and, you know, they could talk to Jeffrey Goldberg. But God damn that's it, not, what are you that's doing? Not, I don't, well, I think they got to go further. But anyway, moving okay, on. Whatever. But they, hadn't done yeah. the, they hadn't even done the minimum yet. Well, that's right. And if they do the minimum, maybe we can build, but they got to get there first. The week of the election is going to be electric. And James and I want to share one of those moments with you. We're taking Politics War Room live to Boston. What better venue than the Schubert Theater on November the 2nd, three days before the election? We're going to rally the troops, hear from a special guest, and celebrate Kamala's upcoming win with our listeners in person. The energy is going to be crazy. Well, what about it, James? Do you think we can get Massachusetts so fired up that Kamala wins the state by, I don't know, 40 points? Well, you know, presumably we will win Massachusetts. What a great city to go to. I I love Boston. We've got a lot of friends there. I hope people show up. Uh, It'll be exciting. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, it'll be lively, you know. The one thing about one thing about Boston and the metropolitan Boston, area, they, they got one of their, every kind you can imagine in the United States, and I, I hope they all show up. But it's just everything is manageable. Ass, it's not very far from the airport. And it, the streets are a little confusing because they were laid out for, you know, cows. But but you know, you, you get a good sense of direction. I, I love Boston. I want to go to. I like to go to, uh, I guess we call it the East End or, or something where or the great Italian restaurants are. By the way, I'll never forget, and let's just mention the great James Earl Jones. And how can you ever forget the Field of Dreams when Kevin Costner shows up there? Yep. I kept thinking in 92, uh, you, know, you know, I don't know, CNN, uh, but that he used to have that this. It, it was in 92, it was like the start, start, cable TV was just getting started. And we had it all, all the time. And I'll just never forget, this is CNN. Don't bring that back. I met James, uh, I met him one time with my son. I took Benjamin when he was 10 years old. Uh, his mother wasn't happy uh, because we went down to Wake Forest to watch Tim Duncan's final basketball game. Uh, and it was incredible. He was there. James Jones was there. Uh, and uh, what connection he had to Duncan, I don't know. But uh, it was a real, real thrill. We want everyone listening to join us on the tour during the election's final stretch. Now, all you have to do is go to politicon.com slash tour and get your ticket for November 2nd at the Schubert Theater in Boston, Massachusetts. Don't wait. They're going fast. And we want to see as many of you there as we can. So head to politicon.com slash tour to get your tickets for November 2. We can't wait to see you there. Beat the heat with Miracle Made Sheets. Oh, man. You, <laughs> one thing I'm familiar with is heat. <laughs> you have it big time down in New Orleans, and we have it big time in Washington. You know what? You know, we are preschoolers compared to Phoenix, Arizona. You know, 20 straight days, it's been over 100 degrees at night. In Phoenix, it has not fallen below, uh, uh, the high temperature has not fallen below 100 degrees since May 27. Well, I hope everybody out there gets Miracle May because sleeping at the right temperature is a critical way to feel rest of the next day. So if you wake up too hot or too cold, we highly recommend you check out Miracle Made bed sheets. Miracle Made sheets are inspired by NASA. They use silver infused thermoregulating fabrics so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long no matter what the weather is like outside. Plus, the silver lining prevents 99.7% of bacterial growth, which means Miracle Sheets require three times less laundry because they stay clean and fresh three times longer. Your bed will feel freshly made every night. 
Stop sleeping on bacteria that can clog your pores and cause breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle instead. Trust us, with no more odors, life is a whole lot better for your household. The NASA-inspired, temperature-regulating, silver-infused fabrics truly give you maximum comfort in any weather, and they make pillowcases and comforters, too. So join us in getting better sleep every night. Not only are Miracle sheets luxuriously comfortable, but they don't have a high price tag of other luxury brands. Miracle sheets feel nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels, so it's a vacation every time you get into bed. Picture yourself in the Caribbean uh, or over in the Mediterranean on one of those islands. It's totally your call. So go to trymiracle.com slash war room to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code war room at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle's so confident in their product that it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. That means if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash warroom and use the code warroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash warroom to treat yourself. So thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode and look for the link in our show notes. Our listener questions this week are as good as ever, and it is really hard to pick them out. Uh, they're mostly, as you might imagine, about uh, American politics and the presidential election. Chris in West Chicago, Illinois, says with each passing day, it will be harder to change the numbers. What are the one or two things the campaign, I'm sure that Chris is referring to the Harris campaign, can do that might yield a noticeable gain, James? I don't... I, I, I appreciate the question. It's a good question. I, I don't know if you have one, it, there's one thing you can do, but you can do a series of things. And I think a big thing happened during the debate. And I think if you try, if you try one single thing, it, it generally doesn't work. But but we talked about it on the show that they could use the calendar to their advantage. I think that they're going to have more kind of, uh, I think the Cheney endorsement or the Cheney thing that he voted for, I, I think it's going to get us some votes in some key places like the Wow counties uh, around Milwaukee. I, I think that she's going to run three or four points ahead of Democratic performance there. Uh, I, I think that uh, Maricopa in, in Arizona, I think that it's like Scottsdale, She'll run a little bit ahead of, of Democratic performance. I think when you grew up on Main Line and in, in, in Montgomery of Delaware and Chester, those kind of places, I think she can run a, 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 even parts of Allegheny a, a, a couple, three points ahead of Democratic performance, and, and that could make a difference. But if I, she I does watch, that, James. She wins Wisconsin, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. I, I agree, and, no. and, and I think that uh, and, uh, and that's why. I, so adamant that that Tillerson and Mattis quit telling other people what the hell they think and tell the country what the hell they right. think. Ross in Portland, Maine says, uh, I think we could go a long way to helping keep, you know, keep Social Security solvent by eliminating the income limit. Is my idea too simplistic or realistic? No, it's not, Ross. Uh, and let me just say as an aside, the worst idea in the world is Donald Trump's to uh, remove all taxes from Social Security benefits. First of all, it would primarily go uh, to upper income. Uh, people who are barely subsisting on Social Security, they hardly pay any taxes anyway on that. Secondly, according to the trust fund, by 2033, it'll be insolvent, which then mandates a 21% across the board cut. That's not going to happen. Uh, but the way to prevent it, the best way is to raise that income limit. I think it's now about 100, you pay Social Security taxes on about the first 150000 If you 
removed it altogether, you raised it, you doubled it up to 300,000. That bring in a bunch of revenue. And I think it's the best way to deal with Social Security. You know, I, 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 I'll just register a concern here. I, I, I think that always, every time I turn around, Social Security is going to be insolvent by some year. And so I said, well, I'm really insolvent. It's just not going to take as much in as it took in or, or something like that. I, I don't believe, I believe Social Security's genius is that it applies to everybody. If you want to raise the income, if it's 150, I think what you're alluding to, after you reach a certain amount that you pay in, you don't have to pay in more. And by the way, it's a lot. It's, it's, and it's a lot for employees. I think like there used to be 7.85 individuals. It's six point, well, yeah, it's 7.65, but only I think 5.5 okay. or something of that it, is Social Security. If you start raising it for employers and individuals, you're going to have a huge pushback. I mean, that would be a really big tax increase of people. And I, I don't, I'm not for, look, if you, if, if, if you can certainly, write, if we've done, we've had income tax applied to Social Security benefits of people certain, over a certain income. I'm totally for that. I'm not, for, I'm very reluctant about changing the basic structure of Social Security. It's worked really well. It's really popular. We don't want to turn these billionaires against it. Have a big lobbying program. I, I, I'm great. Oh, I'm not. I'm not for changing the structure. I mean, they've they've raised that limit probably a dozen times over the years. Limit. Happens all the time. I'm raise it to infinity. Okay, that's what I'm saying. I'd raise it. Bet you want to raise another fifty thousand dollars. Well, that keeps yeah. the structure. It, it, it's would, better. It's better than cutting benefits. I don't think you, I think you can do, you, you know, that there's a thousand things you can do. And why does it have to be solvent? Maybe you have to take somebody out to general fund. But I don't well, know. I'm just reluctant to, to, to mess with the basic way that it works. Well, raising the income limit doesn't mess with the basic. I think you, you can raise it, but you can't. I don't think you should raise it to infinity. I agree. I agree. I said maybe double it, maybe go up a hundred thousand. Yeah, it's whatever. It's whatever the numbers show. Right. Tony, right. and I, this is a question because it's from a great place, which I've never heard of. Tony in Huchenhausen, Germany. Let me repeat that again. Tony is from Huchenhausen, Germany. Tony, it's great to have you listening to us. Tony says we obviously need a large cohort of undecided voters to win. Can we safely assume that if a voter is undecided at this point, they're just not well read? If so, shouldn't we keep the messages simple instead of having mainstream media's wonkish pundits, I don't think he means us, James, debate the nuances of Kamala's policy? Not a bad question coming from, I want to repeat it again, Huchenhausen, Germany. Yeah, it, it's a good question. And what well, we don't know, and there's this whole uh, idea of what happens to undecided voters. And there's been a lot of research, there's been a lot of callbacks. And I, I, I think more the way to look at it is that loosely aligned voters, kind of undecided, the, 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 the true undecided. If you see a poll that's anything much above seven or eight percent, it's not, not going to be a very reliable poll. They're actually, you, you, the public is less than seven or eight. There's seven or eight true independents. Uh, I see some of these polls say it's fifty one forty nine. I guess they allocate undecided some kind of way. Right. I can't tell you the number of hours that I've spent discussing with people what happens to undecided, that where do they go in the ether of the electorate. Uh, but but they are, the, the big figure, but a big encouragement about last night is, there were 28 percent of people said they'd like to know more about Harris. Only nine percent would like to know about Trump. I think yeah. what they found out last night was mostly favorable about her and mostly unfavorable about him. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I where an outside voter ends and a, a loose line voter begins, but it's not a clear dividing line. Protect yourself online with ExpressVPN.
Well, I all you got to do is look at the stories in the, in the on, online in the paper every day. Somebody is getting hacked. If you think the Russians and the North Koreans and the Chinese and the Iranians are, are not looking to hack you, to try to influence you, you, you live in another world. And they can use this, manipulate this information to do anything they want. If, if you're like most people I know, your online life is just part of your life, why wouldn't you give yourself this kind of protection? I mean, it, it, it wouldn't make sense, I don't think, it's at some level. And it's a very well-tested, well-regarded, well-reviewed product. If this is not some fly-by-night group. These are people that know what they're doing. Well, the problem with these huge tech companies is that they don't just want your money. They want to know everything about you. Shadowy data brokers make a living compiling detailed profiles of your online activity and selling them to marketers and other corporate interests that want to control you with targeted ads. They're not selling a product. They're selling you. But yeah. you don't have to let them. There's a way to keep your browsing history truly private and use it every day. It's an app called ExpressVPN. It's scary out there, folks. It really is. Data brokers can easily track you by using your device's unique IP address. If you don't protect yourself, they know who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. Enter ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN hides your IP address and makes it nearly impossible for data brokers to monitor, track, and monetize your private online activity by encrypting 100% of your network. That means your data is kept safe from hackers when you're on the public Wi-Fi, too. So, you know, that's critical. And just think of how many times you've used your devices to access your accounts, have private conversations, or get work done when you're out and about. So ExpressVPN is a must. Whether it's a conference, in a cafe or a client's office. You never go online without it. Knowing you're safe is a big deal. And with kids and grandkids, we speak from experience, when we say that you'll feel great when they're protected with Express VPN too. It works on all your devices, phones, laptops, tablets, you name it. And it's incredibly easy to use too. Just tap one button to turn it on and you're protected. Even tech wizards, like us. We are tech wizards, aren't we, James? Don't wait. Protect your online privacy today by visiting expressvpn.com slash warroom. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash warroom. And you can get an extra three months free expressvpn.com slash warroom. You can find the link in our show notes also. Mike in West Caulfield, New Jersey, says, why don't Democrats make more of an effort uh, to try to appeal to the sports-enthused male? Uh, I would note that one big thing we haven't mentioned yet is after the debate, Taylor Swift uh, endorsed uh, uh, Kamala Harris. And uh, Taylor, we hope you bring your significant other, uh, Travis Kelsey, with you. Uh, and I think that would help. I think athletes help a little bit. Uh, not much. I mean, LeBron James has been very active in campaigns, uh, and as has some others. I would tell you one thing to look for, with all the money the Harris people have, and the Obama people aren't poor, I think there's going to be a lot of ads on Sunday night and Monday night football. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, you raise a good point, uh, Mike. There's no magic panacea, but they ought to do a little bit more. So this is the question. So Taylor Swift, Based on you know the momentum of the night, where Paris clearly had a better debate than Trump, she comes out. If, if so, what, what would you have done if you, you were to grant Poupon the whole thing? I, I, and it was this whole kind of speculation. Boy, if Taylor Swift comes out. Taylor Swift and Doris going to be like, I think it kind of got lost in the after debate coverage. I I, I, would, I would criticize Taylor Swift. For what I know about it, it's perfectly well raised, massively talented. Everything I know about it. her boyfriend and the family is massively positive. 
Uh, yeah, it is not going to, you can't unring the bell, but a, a good question is, would it have been better on a Sunday before an NFL game? J James, that's the world you and I live in. The I'm world that she lives in, let me tell you, there wasn't a Swifty alive last night, today, or tomorrow who's not aware of that. And it's all over social media. We need to ask our friend William Woodson uh, what effect yeah. to have. I mean, I, 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 I just leave the question open. If, yeah. if you can redo it, there's a big question that's going to get answered in this campaign. Because Trump doesn't have, you know, so it was always this big thing. And you would cover campaigns, I would work on campaigns, and people would sit ad nauseum and say, how much of feel matters? How much right. television matters? How much earned media? You know, we used to have names like that. Well, we get ready to find out because Trump doesn't have any field operation. It's not. It, it, Harris, His field it, operation is trying to stifle the vote and trying to get uh, local people. You have people a county to, headquarters yeah, and you have right. a walking list and phone list. And right. you got sort of this and you got county chairman and you got the, the sort of people. And we spent a lot of our lives working these people, covering them. And, you know, who can I talk to? I'm, I'm, I'm going to Western Pennsylvania. You know, hey, give a talk to these people. They don't have any of that shit. Right. Right. And Harris has a lot. And you you know how many conversations that you've had in your professional life. If it, well, and how much is, you know, of every dollar, how much you should allocate for this or that. All right. That's not a conversation we haven't even now. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it doesn't matter. I, 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 and you said, well, a good ground game is worth a point and a half. I, I, you know, we would say stuff like that. I don't think we were wrong or right, but it forced you to think about it. Look, no one is talking about a good ground game because there's no ground game. It's just been a real shift in the way people look at politics or cover it. But we don't, we don't think about the county. And, you know, now it's it, it, the best stuff are these postcard lists that people write out there. We're going to see if this matters any. Here's another one from James uh, of, of Campaigns and What Matters. James in Oakland, California, uh, where she's from, Harris is from, says in 2020, Trump constantly ranted about early voting and how it's rigged. Why in 2024 is he not doing that? Has he suddenly had a change of heart about early voting? Yeah, somebody explained to me that a lot of people at early voting will vote for you. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> It, 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 I don't know. But that's what I don't know the answer to. And maybe a good political scientist has done this. Is this early voting, uh, you know, we used to have this big, remember was absentee voting was a big thing. And if it was easy, does that help? And do, do people vote early, but they voted on election day anyway? Is it a turnout enhancer? Does it help one party or the other? I think a lot of Maybe they're answered, but I don't know the answers. It seems to me to be pretty inconclusive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul in San Antonio, Texas, says, uh, listening to our show the last couple of weeks, he said, like you all, I am not a fan of the current prime minister of Israel. Uh, in your podcast, you pin the lack of progress on the hostage negotiations on Netanyahu. Do you think Hamas is negotiating in good faith not really, but what I do think is if uh, Netanyahu gives them an excuse to also uh, negotiate the way they want to uh, negotiate, if he would take a credible position and try to negotiate, I think there would be a lot of pressure on Hamas, not from us because they don't care about us, but from other Arab countries, including those that support them. But Bibi doesn't want to negotiate in good faith because Bibi has one mission, and that's to stay in office. And if he negotiates in good faith, as our guest David Ignatius told us, and they come up with a plan, he likely uh, will lose his coalition. And if he loses that coalition and he's out of office, you know where BB's going to end up, James? The jail. In the slammer. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so I do blame BB a lot, but unfortunately he's not up until 2026. So uh, that makes me a pessimist about what's going on over there. The, the, the good faith in Bibi Netanyahu, that, that, that's, 
four words that should never be used in the same yeah. paragraph. The last question comes from Frankie in Troy, Ohio. And Frankie asks, are campaign signs a reliable predictor or posters and everything? And are Dems, the second two-part question, second is, are Dems sending any resources to Ohio this year? Well, I got an interesting text from a friend of mine who's working in South Carolina, which is hardly a swing state. And he says, I got, I got it two hours ago. It said, I don't know what the hell this means, but we've had a 300 percent increase in yard sign requests since the debate in South Carolina. That's for Harris? Yes, for Harris. I, I remember when I was did, working in Kansas on the referendum, the post uh, Dobbs referendum, uh, and I think I, I, I pointed it out to you that I talked to the sign people and they said, we're getting signs in Western Kansas that people would have never put up a sign for Biden and Hillary. And I took that as a kind of positive thing that, you know, if you're the accountant or, or the pharmacist at a, you know, Garden City, Kansas, it, it, you might be a Democrat, but you're not going to, you're the optometrist, you're not going to put a sign up because you think it's going to cost you business. But, right. but apparently I, I took great solace in the fact that they were willing to put up, a, which was in a vote, no sign. So I, I don't, I, I'd certainly... Like for the sign, people call me and say, man, we got a spike in sign requests. I, I don't know. I, I know it's good news. I just don't know how good. But it's a good question. It, it, it is. And, yeah. and, and, and Frankie's question on Ohio. Yes, National Dems will be sending resources to Ohio uh, because they have a critical Senate race and probably two competitive House races. Uh, my guess is that Harris and Walls are not going to spend much time or resources in Ohio. Uh, unless they think they're going to be winning this thing by seven or eight points, which unfortunately is unlikely. I, I, keep, I keep coming back, Florida, Florida, Florida. Yeah. Okay, uh, keep those letters coming in, uh, emails coming in uh, to Politicon. They're great questions. We didn't get to them this week. We'll try next week, but thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville and I'm Al Hunt. Now, remember, to get your tickets for the Politics War Room Tour, James and I are bringing the podcast live on stage at the 92nd Street Y in New York City on September 19th. Special guests include Bill Bradley and then the Variety Playhouse in Atlanta on October 12th and Boston Schubert Theater on November 12th. Two, three days before the big election. Now you get your tickets at politicon.com slash tour and we really can't wait to see you there. As always, send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Now following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, Beam, Miracle Made, and Express VPN in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting them, because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. Now, to keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen, and check out our substack at politicswarroom.com. James and I are constantly adding new content, so go take a look. You also can find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. Remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.